All right, Reed, we're going to start. So, back to now we're going to cover all the instructions that uh, pertain to software interrupts as well as uh, returning the IRET returning from an interrupt pertains to whether it was hardware or software you're returning from it. But um, okay, and uh, the int instruction interrupts. Uh, this is this specifies you know if you say int one or int two or int three, it says use a software interrupt to invoke the IDT entry at index one or two or three. No, is that right? At index zero. Okay. So you can say int zero if you want to invoke in by by zero error. Of course, does it have an error code? No. Good. <coughs> so, yeah, you say you know int zero to cause interrupt. Go to the. It tells the hardware, go to the interrupt descriptor table. Like go find the interrupt descriptor table, which you see is sort of like the GDT. So it's some table that's out there. The OS sets it up, and then later on when these interrupts start occurring, you, know, you say int zero. You're telling the hardware, go find the interrupt descriptor table, go to offset zero, and then you know take this logical address and start executing code at that logical address. Ariel, can you grab the door too? Thanks. So an important thing here is that when you issue a software interrupt, it does not ever set an error code. So for all of these things back here which are expecting an error code, like the general protection fault, if you were to say like int 13, for instance, the interrupt handler is going to be expecting a stack that looks like this. It's going to expect I've got one, two, three, six things on my stack. You know, it's going to pop off the first thing on its stack, and it's going to, you know, look at that as an error code, and it will then eventually issue a return, interrupt return on the rest of it. The problem is, like I just said, if you call a software interrupt to do in 13, there is no error code on the stack even though the handler always assumes, look, if interrupt 13 happens, hardware just pushed all of that <coughs> stuff onto the stack because this interrupt 13 always takes an error code. So uh, if you try to invoke with the software interrupt something which has an error code, the handler will probably get confused. And it will eventually, you know, it'll pop something onto the stack which isn't there. Right? So there is no error code. So stack points here, you're popping EIP off, you're treating it like an error code. And eventually, you're returning back to an EIP, which is CS, and E-flags, which is. So uh, there's kind of no point to invoke software interrupt for a one of these error code ones unless you want to try to crash the system. But I'm pretty sure that uh, they're doing their job correctly. We should try it. I mean, definitely see what happens. I just always assume that the DOS is going to not crash to in 13, but let's try that in our VM in a little bit. So int whatever executes interrupt whatever. Uh, let's see, did it say it here? No. Yeah, later on. Oh yeah, there it is. Okay, int three, there's a special caveat with int three. Normally, the interrupt when you're talking about opcodes, it is one byte opcode saying I'm the interrupt instruction and one byte saying this is the interrupt which I want to use. Opcode 1, opcode 2, opcode 3. Uh, there's a special one byte form of interrupt 3, which we said before is the software breakpoint. That was called the breakpoint interrupt plugging. Interrupt 3, there's a special form with a one byte opcode hex CC. So if you were to like, uh, if you were to put, you know, hex CC in some location in memory and, you know, the code is stepping through and executing instructions, when it hits, in, when it hits the opcode byte CC is going to issue interrupt 3. Then the debugger will catch that if there's a debugger. If there's no debugger, you know, the OS will say, hey, can you handle this? And you'll say no, and then crash. And so, but in the presence of a debugger, the point of the CC byte is throw a breakpoint, right? And the debugger should catch that, right? Everything should be up to Oh yeah, and you know, remembering way back if you do, but you probably don't, way back in the intro class when we were talking about that rep stos, right? Rep stos was something where it was doing sanity checking and it had like CCC in EAX, and then it was like writing that to all of the stack memory. And the stack was actually over allocated, so there was a little there was four bytes 
on one side of the buffer, four bytes on the other side of the buffer. All of that was set to CCC. And that's the reason it chose something like CCC, for instance, that if your thing screws up and like jumps to that instruction, for instance, then it'll hit a breakpoint and the debugger will catch it. If your thing just, you know, screws that up and then you're trying to return, the, you know, before it returns, it'll check, are those CCCs still guarding either side? But again, that was just like a sanity check sort of uh, runtime check. I can't remember what they called it. It was just a way so that if you're running your code like in a debugger, you can find out early and conveniently that there's something screwed up here. You're jumping to code which you shouldn't be, and then you'll get a debug breakpoint because it's all CCCs. Or you're accessing, you're writing to data which should not ever be written to because the compiler added that in, and there was never any notion of that data in your original code. So anyways, that's the reason why that way back in intro class, the thing which used the rep sauce was choosing the value CCC to sanitize memory. So that if anyone ever accidentally jumped there, it would go a breakpoint. Yes. All right, so he's asking, does GDB use N3? Yes. Does Windbug use N3? Yes. Any debugger for a software breakpoint is going to use N3. And in particular, this one byte form, we'll see a little quick lab later where we can actually prove that it's using N3 with the CC form, even though it hides this fact from us. They try to hide the fact that you're using this int three, but if we read our own memory, we will see through the lie. So we'll get there when we get past the interrupts. Which, you know, I'm booking it now, so we'll get there. All right, interrupt return. When you issue, when you're in this kernel and you want to return from an interrupt, whether it was caused by hardware or software, interrupt return is just like a normal return in that it expects that there's going to be uh, some sort of information on the stack, whether it's um, just this <clears throat> just this simple information or the more complex information. Uh, it's you know, now it's a good question that just occurred to me. Like, how does it know which form of that it's supposed to be popping off the stack, right? Um, I'm guessing that's based on whether yeah, that's based on whether the CS. So we'd have to check the the CS, right? They would say. Is this CS different from my CS? That is the definition of an interprivilege transfer thing, right? CS, current privilege level is just the bottom two bits of CPL. CS, right? The bottom two, you know, quote, requested privilege level, but in reality when it's CS, that's the current level. So interrupt return when it comes to the actual implementation of the instruction, it's going to have some logic in the hardware where it says, okay, you know, am I returning from something which is, you know, interrupt? Actually, I'm not. I don't think the interrupt is supposed to. The software that handles the interrupt is supposed to pull that off the stack and do whatever. So the interrupt return expects that at this point it's pointing at EIP CS E flags. Inside the logic, it's going to check that CS value. You know, the thing it assumes is CS. It's going to say, is the CS value different from my CS value in the privilege level field? It could be a different index, but if it's the same privilege level, then it knows it's dealing with this kind of data. On but it's a different privilege level. It knows it's dealing with it. How it knows how much data to pop off on the stack into registers. Does that make sense to everyone? Yes. So the hardware on interrupt return is consulting the thing it assumes is CS in order to see it. All right, so interrupt invokes, interrupts through software. IRET returns from them whether they're hardware or software. In three is a special form of in or up three. There's one, typically if you type in three, uh, like an inline assembler, the, the assembler is going to know you're probably asking for three points. So I can probably always does that. If you want to like specify the two byte form of in three, you probably have to like hard code those. The assembler will probably just always assume if you ask for in three, you want the one byte. Right, and then there's these two miscellaneous things which are kind of weird in that this instruction int o or into the only point of it is to invoke the overflow interrupt. There was this thing back here. Yeah, there we go. Interrupt four, overflow interrupt. Um, I think what that really the point of that where that was trying to go was. I have a vague notion, but I think the point is that 
in some cases where you have like some sort of overflow, I feel like at one point I looked through the manual and I'd seen, oh my god, they have like some sort of like built-in like anti integer overflow sort of protection. So like there's some way that you can like turn on where well, it, it may not be some way that you can turn on. I may have been misunderstanding. But the point is you can see how if your compiler was spitting out special code, it could be looking for pointer access and it could say if this pointer, if this data is being used as a pointer, and if it looks like there's like an integer overflow, so like you went, you know, you kept incrementing something to the point where it went FFFF and then you incremented again and it overflows down to zero, right? That's an overflow. You could have the compiler generate code where it detects the overflow and then immediately uses it into instruction to like jump into the kernel and say, yo, I just had a what do you want me to do about it? What are you going to do about it? So I think that's the general point of it, but I don't, I've never seen that, so I don't know if that's what that's there for. And I should also say that the nice thing about that is you don't have to add in an extra like comparison, right? So this int o actually only causes the interrupt if an overflow flag is currently set in it's not like, so you could just keep tacking into O after, you know, some add instructions or something if your compiler said, hey, you're adding to a function pointer. Let's see if this ever overflows. And if so, bam, off the kernel. Uh, so I think that's generally the point of it, but I probably should go look at it soon. And finally, there was the UD2, which is an interesting mnemonic for something which just invokes an invalid opcode interrupt. So when the CPU encounters like some combination of opcode bytes which are not defined, you can have one opcode byte, two opcode bytes, or three opcode bytes. But you can have combinations of those for which they are not valid. I think all of the one byte ones are taken at this point. You can have an opcode which is not valid and then it'll kick off to the kernel and say someone spit out some byte sequence which is not actually uh, real instructions and then it'll, you know, kick up to the kernel. Not sure why you would want to interrupt, do that manually. No particular thoughts on that. Go find it. And let me know. All right, time for the lab. Try to run, try to break down through the other side, or other side defined as current. And current side defined as user space. So, one, we're going to use this to kind of justify my assertion that the hardware is consulting the TSS in order to figure out where that inter privilege interrupt ends up on the stack. So we can see the stack pointer before we interrupt and we can see the stack pointer afterwards. And I'm claiming, although this didn't work for some reason in the last class when I did it the first time, I'm claiming that, oh yeah, I know what it was. I didn't, I said a software break, I said a hard point. Break. Anyways, I'm claiming that immediately after you get into the kernel on an interrupt, the hardware will have consulted the TSS, it would have sucked out the SS0 and the ESP0 and it's going to put those into SS and ESP. And so your stack pointer should be roughly in the range of whatever was in TSS. So let's do this thing. All right. So yeah, I don't think it really even matters that we're in, we're not even going to reboot into PLE. So you should still have your kernel debugger up. And this should be nice and simple, right? Is there anyone in this room who does not have their kernel debugger? Indeed. Nope. Good. Anyone on the phone who only does not have your kernel debugger up? Nope. Not have it up. Okay. Need to learn how to do stuff. All right. We're going to assume you're all up there. So, what we need to do is go ahead and hit G for go or continue. Hit G and press return inside your command window. This will let the kernel debugger say, okay, continue executing kernel. Because okay, otherwise it can't do anything. We're going to go into our VM and the password is again awesome password for the win, like was on the board, capital A on awesome. Awesome space. Password space. Capital F, capital T, capital W, exclamation point. You do not want to reactivate Windows. Hit no. Because it typically doesn't work and then it sits there forever and then you have to shut it down and try again and hit cancel. So 
Do not reactivate Windows on this particular VM. Everyone uh, tuned in here, good. You got the uh, on in and stuff. All right, so inside of our VM, what we are going to do is first click on the Windows XP check build environment. All right, this is some place where we can compile kernel code and stuff like that. You go to the check build environment, bring it up, press X, and press return. I have a leak bat file which CDs you to the correct directory where our code is. Sorry, what's the password again? Awesome password for the win. Capital A on awesome. Space, password, space, capital F, capital T, capital T. So to save yourself some time, instead of typing CD, you can just do uh, X, press return, the bat file will get you to the right directory, which is just C colon in immediate x86 code. Then you want to do CD, uh, is it break on through to the other side. So you're going to have to hit tab twice, this verse will come up with break the hard or whatever. I don't think I ever got that working. Uh, and break on through to the other side. So CD to break on through to the other side. All right, and then we're going to go do uh, build, B U I L D, space dash T. That's saying clean it out before you build it. So this is like a rebuild and bulk. And it should say one executable built at the end. Not say one executable. It shouldn't. All right, so we built our kernel module. We're now going to load this kernel module into kernel space. Uh, and what it's going to do when it's loaded is it's going to go to the interrupt descriptor table and it's going to actually hook one of these entries so that when you call interrupt EE with a software interrupt, it's just, you know, some arbitrarily pick the interrupt in the high address space. When you call int EE, this thing will have changed the interrupt descriptor table so it points to this break on through the other side. And the whole point of this module is it gets the interrupt, it saves the state of the system, and it prints out what the state of the system was immediately upon getting this interrupt. Okay, so try to run, try to hide is going to print out all the registers before you call int EE. Break on through to the other side is going to print out all the registers after you call it. Right, so for right now, uh, we need to install this. And so you can type load and return. I have a bat file. I'm going to install it. And you should see everything. All. Anyone see any of those commands say error for anyone? There should be no errors. It should just say basic create the service errors. Anyone on the phone have an error? Again, I do not care. Yeah, I don't have an error. Don't mind. Don't speak now or forever. All right. Five, four, three, two, one. No one's typing. So, back in our uh, virtual machine, we've now installed an interrupt handler in kernel space, which is for a custom interrupt that we're going to call from user space. So, inside this VM, we need to open up Visual Studio. So, right here on the desktop, there's shortcut to intermediate x86 SLN. Go ahead and open that uh, Visual Studio file shortcut. Go ahead and when it comes up slowly, right click on try to run, try to hide. Right click on it, set it as startup project. And then we're going to expand it and get the code briefly. Right here at the beginning, there's this hooked handler index macro that says int e, or it says EE. So if you wanted to change which interrupt descriptor table thing this hooked, you would change this EE in both user space and kernel space side. And of course, you could look at the kernel space side in order to figure out how to hook it up. But we'll figure that, uh, but we'll describe that later. All right. So the main point of this try to run, try to hide, and this is the same code that's going to execute in kernel space, is it just takes these registers and it moves them over to temporary local registers. Our inline assembly syntax, we can move CS register to a local variable, my C. Else, blah, 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 we get E flags, we get stuff, we get task register frames. 
I think I skipped it too fast, but there's the specific instruction STR for store task register. So that's again a register to register kind of thing. You can dump the task register out, which is 16 bits. It's a segment selector. Dump it out to a register. And we can take and move that register to. So it does that, then it prints it all out. And then right here at the end, it calls int flip handler index, which is. So what we're going to do is we're going to set a breakpoint at the very end. Food. Set a breakpoint there. Got a curl module installed to handle the interrupt. You got a user space code ready to run. And so the only thing to do is, you know, make sure that we've got our kernel debugger still attached. You could use, for this, you could use debug view like before to just watch stuff. But you've got your kernel debugger attached. There's no point. All the debug prints in kernel space will show up. So all we have to do now is bug, bugging. And bam, it's got an, you know, access violation and stuff like that. We don't care about that. So when you get that, it um, So did everyone uh, get that error coming up? And then you hit break. Probably just needs to kernel. So then what we want to do is go to WinDebug and see what it said. Right. So in WinDebug, this is the breakout through the other side. And let's look at the um, and output first. Interesting. I'm going to stop a little again. Yes. library. Okay, well, I don't know why the window is not showing up because when you stop at that breakpoint, it should be the case that the window is still live. Do it. Oh, well, actually, no, that's right. What is there? We actually need to set the the uh, to set the breakpoint at the no op, which was put in there for no reason other than to set a breakpoint there. So there's a no op immediately before you call the interrupt. Set the breakpoint at the no op. Hit stop, and then debug and start again. If you do it that way, before you actually call the thing, all of the prints will have executed, but the erroneous you know, You don't see it because the thing is Yeah. Are you using the taskbar on the host? Yes. And no, I'm not. Oh, yes, I'm using the taskbar on this. Yes. Thank you. Sorry. There we go. Inside of my VM, user space code is like, you know, here's all of my registers before I called the interrupt. Task register was hex 28. That's what we saw before. So it looks like task register seems to be set in user space to the same as set in kernel space. Yes, is one B, all those segment registers. We looked at them before. Some of them are different. PAX is whatever it is. It happens to be initialized to CC. Happened before. Probably I don't have that thing turned off again where it like you know sanitizes my entire stack with CC. PBX was whatever it was. All of this just you know what it was whatever it was. What we care about is what changes from user space to kernel space, right? When you get an interrupt, transition to kernel space, what changes? Then we want to go look at the task register information to see if Stack really was pulled out of it. So that's the information we have there. Go ahead and hit F5 to let the thing just run. Yes, it errors out, but that's fine because over in the kernel debugger, we have you know all the information currently being shown based on run it. So it broke on through to the other side, and what do we have for registers? Task register still 28, no difference. Yes, and SS different because we know there's a big blob of memory for user space, DPL3, big blob of memory for kernel space, DPL. Right, but DS and ES didn't change. And 
you can see EAX did not change either. Right? EAX is still CCCC. EBX is still 7FDB. Right? So what did change is ESP, for instance, and uh, E flags did, but you can't really tell right now. So, and then actually we were pulling out one specific field from E flags called the interrupt flag, which I made brief mention to way at the beginning. And now we're going to come back and understand what is the interrupt flag all about in the context of interrupts. So now we have it being the case here that this does not really uh, prove my assertion before about the task register having the ESP. That task register had like 8055 something in the ESP0. Uh, it turns out this is because this kernel driver is, is not entirely correct. So it is not telling you exactly what the stack was at the time that it came in. So in order to do this, I'm going to wave my hands here and I'm going to use hardware breakpoints, which you've not learned about yet, in order to see exactly the, I will go look at the registers window instead of trusting my debug prints. I'll go look at the registers window exactly when I hit the interrupt. So, close your eyes and count to 10. Open your mouth and close your eyes. <laughs> you should get a great surprise. That was on Simpsons, so it's not dirty. All right. <laughs> do -do -do. All right, I have magically set a hardware breakpoint. All right. I start debugging. I'm about to call the interrupt. I go and then, oh, no error message because in reality that hardware breakpoint has just fired off in the kernel. It says, ah, yes, I see that you've uh, set a breakpoint on this address and that's where I am right now. So what I actually want to do at this point is, you know, go look at the registers straight up. And this still did not validate my assertion. So I'm obviously a liar. So let's go look at the task register to see if maybe it's been swapped out with some other information. All right, so task register is still 28. There, oh, wait a second. Anyways, I know I had this exact same problem in the, uh, the other class, and I looked at it over break, and then I had uh, fixed it, but see what it was. So what am I doing here? Looking at the task register. All right, descriptor, GDT5, and grab the base address, and descriptor, TSS32. Pump that out, and what is ESP? Come on, something in the, no. There we go, good, yes. So the, uh, it wasn't this thing. So yes, at some point the kernel, for whatever reason, has uh, changed where the task state segment has for its ESP zero. ESS zero is still the same, but whenever I checked it earlier, it's changed between now and then. So, but it is the case that right now, the hardware would have consulted the TSS. It would have been F7. Um, at the time when the hardware is about to push those either three or five things onto the stack, it would have been F7, 9F, 9D, E0. And at the time when we get this interrupt, which is the very first instruction, right, we hit the breakpoint at the very first instruction, and by the time we get it, those five things should be on the stack. Therefore, our ESP is set to 9DCC. And so if we took E0 minus CC, right, so E0 minus CC, that's hex 14. And so hex 10 is, you know, 4 times 4 and another 4, so that's 5. So 5 times 4 is hex 14. So we've got five things on the stack waiting for us right exactly when we hit the interrupt. And if we really want to look at them, we could like open up a memory window, for instance, and just type in the register ESP. And we could change from byte to long hex things. So if we're an interrupt handler, we expect a certain form on the stack when we get it, right? And in the case of, you know, the five byte privilege transfer, right? 
we should see saved EIP, saved CS, eFlags register, saved ESP, saved SS. And these values do actually match up. They make sense. The 40 something 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 is a user space kind of default address. 12 something 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 is a user space stack address. So they pass a muster. And if you looked at the segment registers, you could take each of these segment selectors, shift them by three, and see that, yes, these are the user space code and data segments. So there we go. When you issue an interrupt, it goes to an interrupt handler. We haven't seen the definition of the interrupt table yet, right? But when you issue an interrupt, the hardware one uh, goes, I don't know which order is which, but one, it goes out to the task register, finds the task state segment, and says, where's the ESP which I should dump stuff onto? And it dumps, you know, these five or three values on the stack. Two, goes to the interrupt descriptor table at the index you asked for. In this case, it was EE. And then it finds the logical address there, and it goes to that logical address by changing the CS and changing the, and that's one thing I should say, that logical address is, you know, you're vectoring to some code, so it needs to change that logical address, take the CS out of that segment selector, put it into CS, and issue, go to code at that 32-bit uh, offset. Yes. Some interrupt handler code. But, you know, most of the other stuff doesn't. EAX, EBX, EBP even does not change. Right? So you are still pointing at a user space stack frame at the time when you get into this. Right? There it is. EBP, 12FF something, right? So it's on you, the interrupt handler. If you want to start a new stack frame, start a new stack frame. All right, so I want to go on to the description of the table so that we can see, you know, how you set up a table, how you would manipulate a table. And so we can talk about the new attack that I found. All right, so this table just summarizes what the changes were. You know, all the segment registers that we expect to change changed. ESP changed. We expect that because we know it's going out to the task register. And interrupt flag changed from 1 in user space to 0 in kernel space. And so we'll find out about the interrupt flag in a little bit. All right, so first things first. If you issue an interrupt, how does the hardware find the interrupt descriptor table? There is a register, which is known as the interrupt descriptor table register. And this is the IDTR. Just like the GDTR, the IDTR just specifies the base address of some big old table. It specifies the base and a limit. And very much like the GDTR, it is the same format of first you have your 16 bits of limit, and then you have your 32 bits of base. Base linear address, subject to paging and all that. But we got a linear address saying here's where the table starts. And we got a limit saying here's where the table ends. Try to access outside of that, the hardware should cause some sort of fault, right? The point of having a limit on it is I may say I don't want to use all 256 interrupts. I'm using 100 interrupts and I don't care about anything else, right? If you say interrupt, you know, EE, right, that's outside of that 100 range, then the hardware should be able to enforce, oh, base plus limit greater than, you know, the, the index you're asking for is greater than base plus limit times entries. So that's for hardware sanity checking again. Two new instructions. LIDT and SIDT, very similar to LGDT and SGDT. Taking this 48 bits and, you know, storing it off to memory or taking from memory and storing it into the register. Only privileged code can set the register, but unprivileged code can read the register. And this was the basis for the red pill virtualization detection that we'll see at the end of this slide. The fact that you can read the IDTR and that it's going to typically be different inside a virtualized system than it is on a physical system. And just like uh, just like with GD, just like that 48-bit thing that Windebug broke up to the GDTR and the GDTL, uh, this also has the IDTR and IDTL so that if you only want to look at, in Windebug, right, if you're OS code accessing this, you better just read the entire, 
I mean, the you don't have a choice. Uh, when you're OS code accessing this, you issue the SIDT instruction. You get back four, you get back six bytes stored at whatever location you asked it to store it at, and then you need to parse that yourself into the 16-bit and 48-bit or 32-bit part. So here's the basics of how the the interrupt table looks. Uh, well, this is the basis of how you know how big the interrupt table is anyways. Hardware consults the register, looks at the IDT base and says that's the base address for interrupt number one, aka index zero. And it knows that you start at that base virtual address and you add the limit and that's the total size for the interrupt table. It need not be the maximum 256. We just said that the hardware can enforce if you're trying to access outside of the bounds of the interrupt table. Uh, it can definitely detect that. So inside of this table, there are a bunch of, again, we see eight byte structures, right? So 0, 8, 16. A bunch of eight byte structures, each of which is a descriptor very much, well, somewhat like <coughs> how we saw a bunch of eight byte descriptors for the GDT entries. So there are three possible gate types in the interrupt descriptor table, each of which is really just a different structure type. Uh, and we did see that call gate, which is another type of gate. And these gates kind of just are saying, whereas a segment descriptor can have code and data segments, which is saying like this is a blob of code and this is a blob of data. Gates are kind of implying that you're, you know, going through this location to execute code somewhere else, right? This is an opening between that user space, kernel space uh, divide, right? There are gates between user space and kernel space. And the OS says, you may only enter this gate. And so in the GDT, we saw one instance where it wasn't just straight up like, here's a blob of data structure, here's a blob of code. There was the call gate, which is stored in the GDT. And that was a way that you could vector from user space to kernel space. But we said that no one ever uses call gates, even though, you know, Intel put them there so they could go with like system call tables and stuff. But in a, instead, everyone ended up using these interrupt gates, of which there are kind of three possible ways you can do it. Trap gate, task gate, interrupt gate. Board gate. Wait, what? No board gate. Can't hear you. What gate? Uh, board. Board? No, not board, but that one. Yeah, yeah, a board gate. Yes, no. <laughs> That's, and that is, where do I say that? The thing that I need to say at this point is, this notion of trap, this is not it's a trap trap. This is the same word used in a different context, meaning something entirely different. So these gates actually don't have anything to do with faults, traps, or aborts, right? Joke he was trying to make. Abort gates, right? Do we have a, we have a trap gate and we, we don't have a fault gate there either, so, right? It was a good, good effort though, this late in the day. So, this trap has nothing to do with like where EIP points or anything like that. Turns out the only difference between a trap gate and, wait, is it trap and interrupt or is it task and interrupt? Yeah, trap and interrupt, I should really reorder those. The only difference between a trap gate and an interrupt gate, they have the exact same data structure, but when you vector through one of them, this interrupt flag gets cleared, the interrupt flag and the E flags, IF. When you vector through an interrupt gate, IF gets automatically set in E flags to zero. When you vector through a trap gate, there is no change to interrupt flag. And how long do we have to go before we hear about that? Or am I just supposed to explain it here? No. Nope. Many slides still before I explain that. But uh, for now, that's all you have to know is that, you know, if you go through a trap, no change in the interrupt flag. If you go through an interrupt, it automatically gets set to zero. And as it says at the last point, Interrupts are another limited and controlled mechanism that the OS can set up by which you can transfer it from user space to kernel space uh, in a way that it knows and controls. So task gate, we really don't care about this, but I'm only going to say that you know, this is almost entirely empty. These TSS, what I should do is I should go check those uh, IDT entries. Task gate, we don't really care about, and it's basically a way we said the TSS is used for an Intel notion of tasks, and Intel gave hardware, you know, gave hardware support for this notion of task. It was supposed to be used for like swapping between different process contexts, right? 
when we saw that big TSS structure that had a bunch of registers, which I said aren't even used in Windows, but I said SS0 and ESP0 are used. But when Intel made those data structures, they made it so that if you wanted, you could have one task save all of its data state to that and then switch over to another task, potentially through like a trap gate or through uh, different task switching things. But the way that OSs do it themselves is they make up their own data structures however they want because I think they felt that the, the task gate stuff, the t TSS stuff didn't store all the information you would actually want to store, like floating point registers and things like that. When you're switching between two different contexts, you don't want it to be the case that, you know, your floating point registers get destroyed. So I believe the task notion was too limiting. People don't use it. And therefore, the only thing you should know about the task gate is it's one way that you could potentially switch between tasks if you were using tasks or we're not using tasks. I say that, but then you saw those task entries in the, uh, you saw all those TSS entries in the GDT, as Ariel pointed out. There's like four or five of them. So we probably are using it, but I don't know how we're using it, so I pretend that we're not using it. Anyways, interrupt gate descriptors. This is the key one that we want to know. So looking at this, it's actually a very simple data structure relative to, for instance, our segmentation thing. We got a segment selector. We got a 32-bit offset split up between these two pieces. That's a logical address. That's a far pointer. And it's saying when you interrupt, the hardware goes to, you know, interrupt one, interrupt two. Each of them has one of these data structures. And then it says, as long as your DPL, as long as your current privilege level, so you're running in user space code, you got your CS set to 1-1 one, one as the least significant bits. You're running in ring three, right? If I have an interrupt, which is set with a DPL, with this, this gate descriptor is set to zero for its DPL, ring three code may not call this interrupt. If I set, if I'm, you know, the OS and I want ring three code to be able to call this, for instance, the software breakpoint, if I want to allow user space to call this specific interrupt like int three, I have to set this DPL to three so that when the hardware is coming through, it tries to issue an interrupt and it says if current privilege level less than or equal to DPL, allow it, right? And so that'll just allow the hardware to continue. And when the hardware continues, it grabs this far pointer and it changes the CS and EIP to CS is set to the segment selector, EIP is set to the offset, right? So you've just basically, you know, jumped to a far pointer, right? But you're only allowed to jump if you've got this ring, ring level check, right? Again, that's why we covered segmentation first. It ends up recurring again and again. How does the hardware enforce keeping ring three code out of ring zero interrupts? DPL right there, right? So you try to call an interrupt. So that's probably the reason why we can't, for instance, like call some of those interrupts that expect, um, some of those interrupts that the kernel only expects will come in from hardware, right? Because it's going to be setting the interrupt descriptors to zero because the DPL doesn't matter for hardware, I should say. First of all, hardware calls what hardware wants. DPL is about software permissions, right? You've got software running in ring three. You're trying to keep it from, you know, vectoring to something which the kernel only wants, you know, kernel to ever be able to call through software or which it only ever expects uh, hardware to call. So that's what the DPL is about. Doesn't matter for hardware, does matter for software. And then there's only uh, two other things here. There's a present flag, which, again, I don't know that I've ever say like, oh, well, this interrupt gate isn't present right now. You can't. If it were set to zero, the hardware, just like with page tables, would say, oh, you're trying to vector to an interrupt which is not present. We're going to, you know, throw a machine check or general protection fault or some other type of interrupt. But what if your machine check interrupt handler is also set to not present? That's probably when you powers itself off. <clears throat> but we should try that too. Um, and then there's D, which is the gate size, telling you whether this is a 32 or 16-bit interrupt. And I don't think we ever see At least not in Windows 32-bit. So only difference between interrupt gate and trap gate, thinking you'll miss it, is this field, which is mostly set to hard-coded bits, and which, if this were like, for instance, a GDT thing, would be like 
turn out to be something like the type field, right? So it's kind of overloaded. It's kind of like it's using the same sort of structure as the GDT. Sort of like this one right there would have been a uh, system field, and these four right here would have been a type field. But in reality, these are hard coded down, and uh, therefore this is this is interrupt. This is uh, trap. And the only difference with trap versus interrupt, I said before, is if you bounce through an interrupt gate, automatically interrupt flag will be set to zero. And if you go through a trap gate, no difference. And I already described all this. So good. This is just saying there's those hardware access control checks, seeing if you're even allowed to call the interrupt. Oh, the D flag is actually more about whether or not you're, well, at least according to that slide, who knows? Who do you trust? Me or my slides? I trust my slides. D flag is more about, like, for the segment you're selecting, are you vectoring into 16 bit code? And therefore, you only need the 16 bit offset into the segment, right? Because if you're jumping into a 16 bit segment, you only need a 16 bit EIP or IP. Yes. Well, we'll see here in a second when we use that descriptor thing in order to dump the entire, uh, when we dump the entire IDT, similar to command like we did before. But the answer is none. All right. So here's the relation to segments, for instance. So when you have an interrupt, you go to the index in the interrupt table. It's vectoring to a segment if you have permission to do it. You've got a segment selector, and that segment goes down and does the standard thing is it's selecting from GDT or LDT. It's going to say, you know, what's your CPL right now versus the segment's DPL, right? So there's a CPL versus DPL check at the interrupt level, and then there's a CPL versus DPL check at the DPL of the segment descriptor, saying like, yeah, I mean, really, it should never be the case that you can get through the interrupt but not get to the descriptor, right? The OS should be setting it up so that if you are allowed to do this interrupt, you're allowed to go to the descriptor. Actually, because the segment descriptor that it selects is ring zero, it definitely can't be checking your current privilege level at the segment level, because otherwise it wouldn't work. So anyways, ignore that, that there's, there's only this first level privilege check at the IDT. And if you get through that, then, you know, go ahead, because frequently you're going from zero to, or three to zero. And so your user space code, you want to interrupt into the kernel like we just did with that little lab. And therefore, if you can get through the IDT privilege checks, that segment you're going to be selecting is probably a kernel segment. So it wouldn't make any sense to check your permission again because you'll definitely fail on that because you're still in user space. Unless the point is that you're checking against this segment selector, which should have ring zero set. It should be selecting, I'm selecting. Yeah, that's probably it. So anyways, I don't get too hung up on where and when all of those RPL versus CPL versus DPLs happen. But uh, just so that you know that these are the sort of bits you would have the hardware checking when you really care about how does hardware enforce privilege rings. All right, so the point is then segment selector selects a segment and then you take that 32-bit offset out of the thing, add it to the segment base and then you get the actual linear address where you're going to execute code. And that linear address is probably run through some page tables, if you have page table on. And eventually, you have some code executing an interrupt handler. All right, so now we're going to do the lab to uh, take a few looks at the IDT. And all this lab is doing is just using these commands, descriptor IDT, descriptor IDT full. And the IDT full one is actually going to dump the descriptor information and the segment information for whatever segment it selects. But we're going to start with descriptor dump underscore IDT underscore types. So everyone should still have Windabug working. So from within Windabug, if you weren't following along before, make sure you go to break so that you can issue commands. All right, yeah, no. You wouldn't be broke because I had to do that special. So, so what you're going to do is thing descriptor space dump underscore IDT underscore types. 
And so we said there's three types of gates that can be in the interrupt descriptor table. Trap gate, task gate, and interrupt gate. So this will run through and tell us what they all are. So I'll just go ahead and hit return there. And you can see that most of them are 32-bit interrupt gates, meaning that they're vectoring to 32-bit uh, segments. We've got a couple that are no entry, so it's just, you know, they're zero. Used by anything. I believe, no, that's not the case. We have one task gate here. So IDT of 12 is currently set as a task gate, and IDT of 8 is a task gate, and IDT of 2 is a task gate. Now, if we wanted, these are below the, you know, 32 uh, initial set things. So if we want, we can go back and check our notes about, you know, what is interrupt 2, what is interrupt 8, what is interrupt 12. All right, interrupt 2 is NMI, non-maskable interrupt. And so, okay, that's fine. Interrupt 8 is double fault. That's an abort thing that we said, you know, if that ever happens, well. And was it interrupt? These are decimal numbers here. So interrupt 12 is actually hex. Uh, that's the machine check one, which was that other abort. Right? So for each of these, the OS has actually set up that it needs to do some sort of task switch. And that's why we are actually using uh, tasks to some degree. But I don't know whether this is like really required by the hardware based on how you handle these or if the OS shows it. I have a feeling they're required by hardware, but I don't know. Probably, yes. To do. All right. <clears throat> so, right, we dumped out all of the things, but what if we want to look at uh, some specifics of, you know, one of these gates, right? So we said, for instance, interrupt one is the hardware breakpoint for, you know, if the debugger says a hardware breakpoint, it's interrupt one. Let's do a bang descriptor IDT one. Actually, I'm just going to do underscore IDT full, just so that it prints out the descriptor for the interrupt thing, and then it's going to point out the descriptor for the segment which it selects. So what does this say? It says DPL is set to zero, so user space code should not be able to just say int one. Right? User space code will be ring three. This says you must, you know, be ring zero in order to do this. So that's fine. Segment selector says um, hex 8, which turns out to be GDT index 1, which was, index 1 was actually the code segment for all of kernel memory, all of memory in ring 0. And if you print this out, you know, you can see that as well. It's 0 to FFFF1, right? But what we really care about, since we know that that segment is based at 0, is we can just grab that offset, 804D, whatever. And we can throw that into our disassembly window over here. If we do that, it's now going to show us the code which by default handles hardware breakpoints for the OS. And we can see this is in the NT kernel module, or sorry, the NT kernel itself. It, it calls it NT rather than NTOS kernel or NTPA.exe to be just generic so that you don't have to worry about whether you're in PAE mode or multiprocessing mode, et cetera. They just call it NT. So we're in NT and it's got a function named KITRAP1, so that's not particularly you know, verbose, it's not like saying, hey, yeah, I'm the, you know, interrupt handler or something like that. If you want to see the verbose version of what everything is being handled by, you can use the built-in command, bang IDT, and then dash A. And what it's going to do is it's going to walk through the IDT and it's going to take that 32-bit offset and it's going to try to resolve that to a symbol. It's going to say, based on my symbol information, what function is this in what module? So if you do that command, get a bunch of stuff, take a while, <laughs> and we scroll back up. And so, for instance, this initial stuff is not particularly uh, revelatory. Uh, it just says, okay, I'll trap zero, one, two, three, whatever. And we know they're not even trap gates in the first place. Or do we know they're not trap gates? Let's double check that quick. <clears throat> 
if something were going to be a trap gate, like maybe my you know module is wrong or something, if something were going to be a trap gate, we would expect that it would have a trap gate descriptor, right? And if we look at the literal bytes, we would see that you know one, two, three, four, five, and then the zeroth bit of the sixth byte should be set to one if it's a trap gate. So I'm going to look at the literal bytes. I'm going to say the zeroth bit of the fifth byte be set to one if it's a trap gate maybe my code draw so one two three four five right so the fifth byte is zero so the zeroth bit is not set to one so this is definitely not a trap gate but uh, Microsoft still names their functions like you know ki trap whatever whatever so a bunch of things called ki trap it looks like they use that term mostly for all the stuff below uh, 32, which were all those predefined ones, right? Except this one thing, uh, 31, is set to hell. That's hell.dll hardware abstraction layer. It's supposed to be a thing which kind of like, so that if Windows wants to run on ARM or Intel, want, Windows wants to run on x86, hardware abstraction layer is supposed to, you know, abstract that away because things like, you know, WinCE do run on, you know, ARM phones and stuff like that. So, this function turns out to be in HAL and it's called help a pick spurious service, whatever that's worth. But anyways, this is a useful thing. Uh, hint, hint. Maybe in some cases it would be nice to know if some malware is hooking the interrupt descriptor table, such as our malware at interrupt EE. To, oh, look at that. Interrupt EE. It's saying this is break on through to the other side. That's the module name plus some offset because it doesn't know symbols. It doesn't know function names. Yes. Bang IDT space dash A for all. <coughs> yes. So if you do not have a dash A, it'll only show you stuff that it thinks uh, should not be handled by NT or HAL because most all of the entries by default are NT or HAL. But not doing dash A, unfortunately, I think it doesn't. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's the thing. It does have some hells, but not others, which is good. Right? So, bang IDT without dash A, I believe it just has some specific offsets it looks at. Although, maybe not. Okay. So, for, for values which are greater than some number, it looks like it is still listing uh, break on through to the other side. I had seen a case where I hooked something low, like int 14, or, yeah, int 14. So, I hooked the page fault handler. But this bang IDT didn't show that the page fault handler had changed unless I used bang IDT dash A. So that's the built-in command for what it's worth. If you're doing some incident response or something like that, uh, you could use live kernel debugging where on the system you don't have to have a separate kernel debugger set up. You can actually use, you install WinDebug. Um, you do something like this. WinDebug installed. Run WinDebug, you go kernel debug, but then you select local. And what it does behind the scenes is it kind of takes like a crash dump of memory. It just grabs a big chunk of memory, writes it to file, and then it starts debugging around in it as if it were debugging a live system, but it's not. Let's see if I selected local debug. I could still do, this would be the, uh, well, I'd need to set up my symbols. I set up my symbols, I could do the bang IDT and see all of the stuff. And that's the kind of thing we'll cover in the rootkit class in terms of practical tools that you can use to look for subversions of core, ports, core parts of your system. All right, so good. We're, we're a good 10, inch, 10 15 in, uh, things, no, like 10 away from being done with interrupt and see whether I should give you a break or not. No break for you. All right, interrupt masking. This is like the last main topic I want to talk about. All right, I mentioned the interrupt flag way long ago when I was asked about CPU ID. And I mentioned the interrupt flag is the only difference between an interrupt gate and a trap gate. What is the interrupt flag all about? It is about masking of software interrupts. So if a software interrupt occurs, or is it hardware as well? I think it's only software. 
Oh yeah, it does mask hardware as well. There's only some a couple of exceptions to this. Okay, so if the interrupt gate, if the interrupt flag is set to zero, that means no more interrupts, please. There's a couple exceptions. There's that non-maskable interrupt, which can break on through all the time. Right? You may not mask it, but otherwise, when you set the interrupt flag to zero, it says, I don't want to hear about any other interrupts. APIC, thing that, you know, hardware that handles interrupts, don't even tell me about it until I tell you it's okay to go. So, for instance, when you have an interrupt gate, I said interrupt flag automatically gets set to zero. So that means when you call int whatever, everything else stops in terms of interrupts. This code runs, and then when it's done, it returns and the interrupt flag automatically gets set. In other cases, there you may... Uh, in other cases, you may want it to be the case that you set this manually rather than through an interrupt gate. Say you're in the kernel and you want to just, you know, temporarily quick stop the interrupts, do something, and then turn them back on. You can use the CLI for clear interrupt. You know, clear it, set it to zero. Clear the interrupt flag or set the interrupt flag, which sets it to one. Both of these are ring zero instructions because you don't want user space saying, no more interrupts, please, and your mouse doesn't move and your work card doesn't get packets taken off of it, right? So stopping interrupts is definitely a kernel only kind of thing, right? But kernel can say no more interrupts for a while until I set them back on. And whenever user space transfers through to kernel through an interrupt gate, but not a call gate, for instance, so call gates way before. And I think this is the reason why people ended up using interrupt gates rather than call gates for system call things. You go through an interrupt gate, it's like everybody shut up. I'm doing my, you know, system call dispatching, do it, and then return. So that is the interrupt flag in e-flags. And, okay, it doesn't say it here. I think we say it later on in the debugging section, but when we were talking about the push FD and pop FD for the e-flags register, right, we said you can dump e-flags to the stack, you can pop e-flags back off the stack, you may not pop the interrupt flag, right? We just said, if user space code can clear the interrupt flag, everything comes to a grinding halt. If pop FD, which is a user space instruction, allowed you to pop the, you know, E flags, including a zeroed out interrupt flag back into the E flags, everything would come to a grinding halt, right? So that's an example of where there's a flag which may not be set based on pop FD, but which may be set based on IRET. Right, so if it's an interrupt return, go ahead, change the e-flags. That is why the e-flags is saved. There, right? Why do you save the e-flags uh, what it was beforehand instead of just going back to whatever code was running and leaving everything the same? Is because that beforehand e-flags was definitely not set to having its interrupt disabled. Right? But Afterwards, if you've just jumped through an interrupt gate, it definitely is set to being disabled, right? And so you need to return back to the same state you were at. And the only, I'm not going to say it's the super only way, but I'm pretty sure it's like almost the only way that you can set the interrupt flat. Yeah, we just talked about those two instructions. But so other than the, you know, set the interrupt flag and clear interrupt flag ring zero instructions, the only other way you can set the interrupt flag is when you're popping e-flags off of the stack as part of an interrupt return. And we'll see when we get to debugging, right when we're done with this section, that there's another flag related to debugging which is similar. You can only do it with an iret, not, and there is no like other special commands for this one. You can only do it with an iret, uh, and that's the only way you can set that, flags and e that flag. All right, so finally, we're pretty much done with this. The only uh, one other thing to say about this, okay, sorry. One more thing, interrupt flags does not mask the explicit invocation of the interrupt instruction, the software interrupt, when you're, you know, say you just had an interrupt, right? You just called int3 and the int3 handler is running around. If for some reason, either malicious or accidental, there's a software interrupt inside of that, yeah, it's usually accidental like when I'm doing uh, breakpoints in the kernel, if there is an int whatever inside of some place, you can't guarantee that because the interrupt flag is set to zero that that software interrupt is not going to kick off. It doesn't stop you from issuing code that says give me int 3, give me int 4, give me int 5. Right? So that's just a caveat. Uh, 
don't expect the interrupt flag to stop you from calling instructions, which is probably a good thing. And finally, the interrupt flag does not mask the quote non-maskable interrupt, interrupt to. Okay, so we said that, okay, so this is an example where deep knowledge of the system, you know, came up with some information which people consider useful, the ability to detect virtualization, right? So Jenna Rakowska, you know, knew how interrupts work did, worked, and she knew that she could use the store, uh, store, ID, store IDT register instruction in order to read out the value in the IDT. And what she observed was, and I think she said in her original paper, she was like playing with some rootkit in, yeah, she had, she had like a, I believe it was a um, Linux rootkit. I don't remember the name with an S. She was playing with a Linux rootkit and the rootkit was just crashing all the time in her VM. It turned out it was because the rootkit made some assumptions about where the IDT was, right? And so they just said like, I know that the IDT on this Windows system is always right here in virtual memory. They didn't even, you know, bother with consulting the, uh, consulting the interrupt table register. So the rootkit was crashing, she was debugging it, and she's like, this seems to be expecting that the IDT is right here, but why would I expect that? Because in my VM, it's actually right here. And she's like, oh, I go outside of my VM, the interrupt descriptor table is always here. I go inside my VM, it's always someplace else. And understanding the fact that there's disparity there, she could say, if I see that my interrupt descriptor table is in this rough range, I know I'm in VMware. If I see it's in this range, I think I'm in virtual PC. So it was just because, like I said before, virtualization systems can't let the guest OSs have access to this one register that exists for the hardware, right? They must virtualize registers, expose fake interrupt descriptor tables, right? And, uh, and therefore, these can differ between uh, hardware and virtualized systems. That was the original code. We're going to do the verbose version of this, where it's nice and simple. So behind the scenes, this little byte string right here is a uh, complex, she's just, uh, yeah, I think these first three instructions maybe are part of the opcode. The byte sequence is basically uh, just hard coding the SIDT instruction and then hard coding the address where you want to store the stuff to. And so it turns out she, see, when she's doing this R pill of three, she's actually like overwriting three bytes into this. She's saying, I want to store M at R pill of three. So she's just like saying, I don't know what I want to store this in. I want to store it in my local variable. So it's uh, needlessly complex, but it's certainly short and sweet. And that was the point to try to make it uh, small and show how easy it could be and how little code was actually necessary in order to detect virtualization. So we're going to run this one inside and outside the VM, obviously, so that we can determine whether or not we're virtualized or not in each system. So outside the VM, go ahead and go to your, uh, go to your Visual Studio. And we want to set the startup project to verbose red pill. And if we look at it, it's uh, fairly simple. We have a local variable storage, which is six bytes long to hold our 48-bit, you know, interrupt descriptor table register. And we even mem set that to zero, just to be sure. And then we just issue the instruction SIDT, which says take whatever the IDT register is, store it to the memory address that I'm giving you now. And that memory address here is the storage address. And then all it does is it looks at the most significant byte of that six bytes. And we know that since it's 32 uh, bits worth of base and then 16 bits worth of, um, 16 bits worth of limit, all you really care about is the most significant byte of the base, right? You're saying, does it start with 8000? Does it start with F000? Because what she found was that between virtualized and uh, real systems, it, it was that most significant byte which was differing there. So that's all it does. And right now you can see it's saying if that byte starts with FF, then this code is being run in VMware. So I'm expecting right now that when I run this outside of the system, the IDT does not start at some FF something, something, something address. Right? 
So set a breakpoint at the very end on return cassette and run it. And let's see if it actually works. This code is being run on a normal system. Fabulous. What about inside the VM? So now, uh, back at your kernel debugger, you need to let the, the VM actually run. So in your kernel debugger, hit G and return to go. And once your VM is running, go into it. Stop whatever you're doing in the VM. Set verbose red pill to the startup project in the VM. Set a breakpoint at the end of verbose red pill in the VM. There. I'm just going to set it at the end. And then just run it in the VM. And let's see what I got. Fail! Yes. Right? So the question is, um, what is the difference, though? Is there actually a difference here? Can we figure out what the difference is? So, you know, it may change between different systems and stuff. Actually, why did, I think I had that break. Well, let's see here quick. This is yet another one that I feel like failed initially in the other section, but we can get through this. We can debug it. Start breakpoint. Need a there one, two, three, four, five. That one's eight zero zero something. And outside of my VM, I feel like it's gonna be eight zero zero something as well. You know, for all I know, VMware changed this so that it doesn't actually, you know, look completely different now, right? But, yes. It could, but since I know I used the same VM last year, uh, I don't think... Give me a second. Let me see my own. Oh, that's lame. It doesn't want to let me look at my IDTR register from local kernel debugging, even though it's obviously uh, allowable. Actually, I'm going to look in Visual Studio instead. So let's try setting a breakpoint here. I don't think so necessarily. One, two, three, five. Wait, zero, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, it's definitely different. Right? So outside my VA VM I got BA, and inside my VM I got eight zero. Did anyone else see eight zero inside the VM? Yep. Right. So I would suggest that because like I said, this I didn't say, but this can kind of float around actually if you go look at like the original description. She didn't say anything about this FF byte. I set that based on my previous use of this VM. I saw that inside my VM, oh, it looks like it ended up being FF. So I'll set that in my verbose read tail. So we can definitely see there's a difference because if you set the breakpoint at the same point on each of them, uh, it's stored. So really right now it looks like the correct way to have this code would be if you change that FF to 8.0, then if you change it in both of them, then inside the VM it would say, oh, I'm a VM, right? Demo fail, but whatever. You can see the difference here, right? All right, so that's it for interrupts, which we totally whipped through. Well, it's not it yet, but I'm going to give you a quick break, and then we're going to come back and I'll talk about that new attack that I found. And it's only possible to find that attack because I knew about segmentation and interrupts in detail. I could have also found this, but I'm at the class. I was working first. All right. So anyways, five-minute break.
if anyone has any questions on the phone or in here, go ahead and ask them.